The Timberwolves select Kevin Garnett from Farragut Academy. A high school kid? No chance. You saw the future of what basketball was about to become. He does whatever it takes to win a basketball game. All I know is all out. I do. I want to be challenged to the end. Anything's possible! DraftKings has brought their expertise to legal sports betting. DraftKings Sportsbook is the best in the game. It's a legitimate sportsbook based right here in the U.S., so you can sleep easy knowing your funds are secure. All new customers can wager $1 on the game of their choosing. And so long as the game doesn't end in a 0-0 tie, you will win $100 in free bets. That's right. Bet just $1 on any basketball game, and DraftKings Sportsbook will give new customers $100 in free bets once either team scores a point. Check it all out through the DraftKings Sportsbook app. There are player props, live betting, future betting, and much more to mess around with. Jack, we got some interesting matchups this week. The Wizards versus the Heat, Mavs, Suns, and the historical rivalry Lakers versus Celtics. What matchup intrigues you the most? I really want to see the Mavs Suns matchup, man. I want to see Chris Paul and Doncic go at it, man. Luka's been getting off to a great start, and the Mavs are playing good. But Phoenix is one of the top contenders, so it's going to be a good game. Yeah, Phoenix is hot right now, so that's definitely going to be a good one. This year, DraftKings Sportsbook is giving all customers a chance to win big with their Game of the Week Wednesdays. Bet $50 on any market for that week's chosen game, and customers will receive $1 per point over $200 towards a free bet. Don't miss out on this week's basketball action with DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app. That's promo code SMOKE. Head to the app now to check out all the great odds and promotions DraftKings has to offer. Today is a great day, bro. I agree. The sun is shining. You know I keep the greenest of grass. And I'm spending happy. Oh, yeah? Yeah. When I buy something, I get to treat myself with money line. Okay, there you go. Yeah, with Moneyline, I can get up to 5% cash back, earn up to $500 every day on eligible purchases, and I can round up some spare change for crypto. Wow, it's like a vacation in your wallet. Yeah, it's a sabbatical from stress. It's a fiesta for your finances. It's the perfect alley hoop to my purchases. Why worry when you can spend happy? Moneyline, bank, borrow, invest, or grow, all in one app. Hey, man, we got a special guest today, man. North of the border, Toronto Raptor, NBA champ. NBA Fred champ. Van Fleet, man. Welcome to the show, bro. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me, man. Glad to be here. Uh, yes, no sir. doubt, man. Yes, we sir. appreciate your time, bro. Jack, let's get to it. Let's get right to it. Van Vliet. I'll just this, this how my homeboy said. Van Vliet. Van Vliet. <laughs> that, that's is how you say what, it, it, what is when that? He, is that he, French? He, is that French? I think it's Dutch, but I really Dutch? don't know. Yeah, somebody told okay. me it was Dutch, so we're going to go with that. It's, it's fancy. <laughs> yes, it my is. Home, my, my, home, my home while we playing the game, and when he scored, we say, Ben Bleet! Ben Bleet! <laughs> 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 All right, here we go, man. So how's the season going so far, uh, and what is it like having Siakam back? The season going good. I mean, we started off uh, decent. Um, we just lost, so... Not so good right now, but uh, just having Pete back, getting him back in the flow. He, I think he missed the first 10 games. Uh, he's going to be a big part of what we do, obviously. So just getting him back, working him back in and seeing kind of how the chemistry and the rotation is going to go from there. Um, but I think we got a shot. The team, not half of the vets gone. You know, you have Lowry gone, you got DeMar gone. And it's a big change, but you've been, you know, like you said, coming from the bottom and, and now having that role as being a leader. You know, it took me, I think, what, eight years to my career until I became a captain of a team when I was in Golden State with Matt. But having that role now 
what 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 changes for you and, and and what's your approach is your approach different it's a little different i think i'm just kind of more mindful of like what i'm doing when i'm not talking you know what i mean like i, I always been vocal since i've been playing since i've been getting minutes i was always vocal but i think now like i'm just noticing you know it's more eyes and they're kind of watching your body language and things that you do when you're not speaking like all eyes is on you at all times and it's different because like you said we don't really got vets you know what i mean it's me mm -hmm. pascal and then i think it's Dragic. And that's it. So it's like I'm teaching guys how to do layup lines and, and teaching them the plays. And you know what I'm saying? So it's like it ain't just on the court. It's, it's everything and on the court, off the court. And, and that's been probably the biggest challenge is just pulling guys along that don't really have a, a point of reference or nothing to compare it to. This is really their first experience in the league. Yeah, Matt, Matt said it all the time. It's, a, it's not the... It's not what we came into. We came in the league. It was a lot of vets. We had a lot of guidance. We had a lot of guidance. How did you find your game? You know, what made you fall in love with the game? And who did you idolize growing up? I was five years old when I first started really playing. And um, my dad was a hooper. And then uh, my brother, my older brother is three years older than me. So he he got into basketball right before me. Um, so I was watching them. And, and we would just, you know, we would go out and play in the driveway, things like that. Um, and then, like, my first memories was, um, I think it was the Lakers uh, Sixers finals. You know, I was a little boy and I just mm -hmm. felt I just fell in love with Kobe and, and fell in love with the Lakers. And, and it was it was all she wrote after that. So um, I really only was ever like a fan of Kobe growing up. Um, and as I got older, I, I started to to add different things from everybody. So I used to have, I used to get the slam magazines and put them on my wall. You know, they had the big cutout. So mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would have yeah. uh, J Kid, um, Kobe, AI, uh, D Will, all the like all the guards, Chance, all the guards that that I felt like I could take something from their game, and I just put them on my wall in my bedroom and. I watch the game, go outside, practice, you know what I'm saying, and just try to add as much as I could. And it's just funny because I don't really have, like, the body type of an NBA player, but, like, I was adding the footwork and the, and the angles and things like that, you know, the whole time. Mm, mm, mm. Born in Rockford, um, about 90 miles out of Chicago. What was it like growing up? You mentioned you had an older brother. Uh, what was your childhood like? My childhood was, was split. So, like, my dad was killed when I was five. Um, so then it was just it was just me and my mom and my brother. Uh, we grew up kind of like on the white side of town. And then my mom met my stepdad when I was like 10. Um, and then we moved over to the other side of town. Um, and my stepdad was a cop. So uh, like I had I had I had both worlds like my biological dad was in the streets. My stepdad was a cop. So it's like mm -hmm. I got to experience a lot of different things at an early age. And I seen a lot, done a lot. Um, but, you know, the one thing that was always constant was just basketball. I just try to stay out the way. Um, and as I kept growing up, like I was safe at home. I always tell people I was safe at home. Home was was safe for me. But when I went outside, you know, what I mean, I still had to to manage and, and get it on my own. And so that's kind of like where I earned my stripes as far as just life and being a man um, mm -hmm. growing up, you know, seeing 13, 14 year old boys getting killed like that. That was normal at that time. Um, and then as I got older, I started to look back like, damn, that shit was fucked up. But at the mm -hmm. time, you really don't know no better. You know what I mean? So I just always focus on, on the game. And my parents, they they couldn't afford for us to go to school. So they just told us, play basketball, get a scholarship and, and go from there. But I always wanted to be in the NBA, you know, as early as I can remember. Mm. Talk to us a little bit about your stepfather, uh, you know, kind of his guidance, your guys' early morning workouts uh, and, and what he kind of instilled you from that kind of standpoint. Yeah, so he was a uh, he was like a military nut, you know what I mean? Like he was he he joined the military at like 19, then he went and boxed in the military, came back, uh started being a police officer. Um and so he was real strict like instilling discipline and respect and morals and values and things like that. So a part of that ended up being um, you know, these basketball work Else, once we start taking basketball serious, he'll wake us up, take us to the gym. And he didn't really know too much, but he was learning on the fly. Like he was getting DVDs and all the things back then. We would watch the DVDs and learn the drills and go to these different camps and try to build just our our, our knowledge up. And um, he really just took the time out for all of us boys. It was four boys in the house and he would just put us through the ringer. We was doing all type of workouts and, you know, whether it was like doing just doing push ups and sit ups or doing cone drills. We play one-on-one -on -one with weight vests on full court and 
I was I was the you know the little brother with my two older brothers because my younger brother he wasn't really into it like that but the older two and they just beat me up we'd be fighting you know fist fighting and and that's just how it went and that's that's kind of how like I got my toughness. Talk about your high school days at Auburn High School in Rockville, Illinois. You you helped Auburn to a 22 game win streak, which resulted in the school's first Illinois High School Association Final Four since 1975. How was it in high school? High school was cool. So again, like I come in, you know, I'm I'm like the best talent in the city. I come in, I got a great high school coach, old fashioned uh, coach. You know, defense first, teach you how to play man to man, all of that stuff. In my ninth grade year, I thought I was supposed to be playing varsity. He ain't let me play varsity. <laughs> um, yeah, so like I had to deal with all that. And um, my older brothers was both on the varsity team. I ended up playing varsity like halfway through the year and just just went from there. But it's a smaller town. So like the, the you know, the eyes ain't really on it like that. Everybody just go to Chicago um, to kind of, you know, get the talent. So we always had that chip. And um, I just always just focus on winning, man. And, and we won a ton of games. I was able to take them down state uh, my senior year, like you said. And um, I was just trying to get in school and also help help all my guys that I was playing with get in school as well. You stay loyal to your AAU team, the Rockford, your Rockford team. You didn't want to, you could have had the opportunity to go to a biggest team, AAU team in Chicago, but you chose, chose to stay loyal. A lot of people don't do that, but me, I was big on loyalty as well, uh, knowing that I could have went other places. Uh, I went to Oak Hill my senior year, but a lot of people don't understand how how important that is and, and how the love you build with people, especially the people that you start with. And to get some success and leave them, that's just something that we don't do. You know what I'm saying? So what was your thought process with staying loyal to your Rockford team? I mean, you said it. Like, it's just who I am, you know, as a man. And, like, I think I grew up really fast, so I was kind of more mature at that age. So, like, when they came and dropped the big bag, the big duffel bag with all the shoes and gear and all that, like, that didn't really move me. Like, I wasn't going to mm -hmm. go leave my guys just because y'all had some fresh shoes and, and uniforms. And the really what it boils down to the most is two things. Number one was we was competing with them. Like when we go to the mm -hmm. tournaments, this team that I got, we, we, we playing in the same championship game. Now, win or lose, whatever, the same scouts, they be there on them Sundays watching them championship games. The, right. the schools come to see the championship bracket and we was always in those games. So I'm like, all right, even if y'all are better than us, y'all ain't that much better than us. So I'm not leaving right. them. And then number two was, these are the guys that I'm rubbing shoulders with every day. It's like one of my guys, like, I ain't gonna say his name on here, but this is this is the guy who was pulling pistols out for me. Like, how am I gonna leave him? You know what I'm saying? Like, right. when we walk right. around school, how, how can I leave him when we gotta walk these same hallways and you know, I'm dropping him off, you know, at his house and he come pulling up to my house. I can't, I ain't gonna be able to look at him in his face if I'm leaving and going down the street to play for just a bigger name when my goal was always the NBA. My goal wasn't to go to a power five school or a big school. Like I just was like, where can I go to play and get to the NBA? And it worked out for me. Mm -hmm. What colleges was recruiting you? Any memorable stories from, uh, from college recruitment? Yeah, so I had a lot of uh, like mid-majors early on. My first couple of years, um, I remember I went, I had two experiences. So I was get I was getting those questionnaires that that they I don't know what they do now, but um when I was in high school, they would send these uh these questionnaires and you would get the letter and the letter would have a school name on it. So my first couple ones was like Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Illinois. So I'm like, oh, I'm lit. Like I'm thinking this is an offer. <laughs> so I never forget, I go to I go to Illinois for a visit. It's like it's like eight other guys there on a visit with me. So I'm looking like, damn, what, what? I thought this was just for me. You know what I mean? It's like eight <laughs> other kids there. So we cool. We go. We go to the little cookout. And then Wisconsin, we went to Wisconsin. And it was like 15 guys on that visit. And I never even talked to, I think Bo Ryan was a the coach there. I don't even think I even talked to him while I was there. I talked to the assistant. And then I just remember me and my mom, we was going, we were supposed to go to the football game. Um, and we just kind of, we wasn't feeling the vibe. So we just told him, like, all right, we're going to go to the bathroom. And me and my mom, we just dipped. We got in the car and we went home. Like, <laughs> we was like, all right, we cool. Like, we ain't, we, we not, we not rolling like that. So after that, that was like my freshman year of high school. After that, I just started focusing on the schools that was really interested in me. So it boiled down to like Wichita State, Colorado State, and a few others. 
And then I committed early because I didn't like the recruiting process. So once I committed, then mm-hmm. that's when like some other schools came along, Kansas and Virginia, things like that. But I was already locked in with Wichita State. You've been credited with the resurgence of Wichita basketball. I actually remember watching your your 2012 and 13 season. I was like, yo, who's this little light-skinned European cat? Because I hear your last <laughs> name, and I obviously didn't know you couldn't hear you. Speak. This nigga's out here killing. But y'all went 31-0 and uh, for the first time in Division One history. Uh, you led them in assist. Like you said, it was never really about the big name. Your goal was to get to the league. So what was your college experience like? Because you put in a lot of work in college. Again, my college experience was great. And it's crazy because it's like it's the same pattern everywhere I went from high school, college, and the pros. So when I, when I went to uh, Wichita, I was like a top 100 recruit. You know what I mean? I'm like the biggest recruit they had there. And I get there and the starter point guard was like, I was 18, so and Malcolm Armstead, he was 23. He had just transferred from Oregon. He was like a fifth year senior, one of them type of guys. And man, he used to bust my ass every day, <laughs> like every day. And that was humbling for me because like I'm not ready yet. Mm. I'm not ready yet. But I just kept working. I locked in with him. I learned a lot. Um, and Greg Marshall, who's a, who was a great coach, um, he taught me a lot about just you know how to play the game the right way and, and how to win. And, um, you know, I was able to learn that at an early point, you know, at 18, 19 years old. So by the time I did get my chance that next year where I could run the show, I was sharp. I was already ready to go. And and it was, you know, all she wrote after that. Wichita State is good at recruiting. My sister, my sister was probably top 10 in the country. And she signed Wichita State. And then they, they recruited me and I almost went there. But one thing about that school, they do great. They do a good job at recruiting. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a hell of an atmosphere. And there's no football um, it's really nothing else. Like the, the basketball team is like a pro team. They really treat it like a pro team in Wichita. 10,500 people come out, sell out every night, preseason, exhibition, it don't matter. Um, and that's what drew it to me when I went on my visit. I went there and um, I could just feel the community. You know, they fly charter. Like it's really like a big time program. Um, mm-hmm. that people, you just got to go there to see it. Because when you think of Wichita, Kansas, you think of like tumbleweeds and cowboys and stuff like that. Right. But it really is not like that once you go on your visit there. It's it's, it's decent. Jack, you know, goddamn well you wasn't going to no mother. <laughs> hey, 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 I, I was going to Wichita State because I was in junior college at the time, so they made it look good. Yep, yep. And uh, we, had a, we had a lot of junior college guys too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think a lot of the time, you know, I got a chance to go to UCLA. I think a lot of the time the knock on these divisions are that you guys really don't play anybody during the regular season. Woo, woo, woo. But then you guys get into the into the tournament and, and your team particularly made a run to the final four. What was it? I mean, what was it like getting in the tournament and really starting to play these bigger teams and knocking them off? Well, it, it's a double-edged sword. So it is true. Like the talent level is a big gap in the talent level. Like let's not, I ain't, I'm not going to sit up here and lie. But at the same time, the coaching is better and uh, the attention to detail is better because it is less talent. So we we putting ourselves through the grinder all year with less talented teams. But like we we in a, every conference game, the other team know every play you're going to run. They know all your tendencies. They know your scouting report. Like it's just a much more intense. So by the time, time we got to the tournament man we playing these big power five teams and we we usually undersized they got these big guys they can't guard they soft you know what I'm saying the coaching is not the game plan is not what it should be so we super locked in when it's time to go it's time to go we hungry because we've been waiting on this like we can't get these teams to schedule us during the regular season nobody wants to play us during the regular season so in a tournament you can't run so you know we just waiting on this all year and add to the fact that we had a good collection of talent, um, especially in my four years there. You know, we have a few NBA guys, so um, we just we just capitalized on the moment and, and really just went out there like, you know, play like we needed it because we did. Did it ever cross your mind to, 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 to leave early or was four years kind of, I'm going to take these four years and see what happens after? No, nah, if like... Knowing what I know now, I would have been left, but I didn't really understand how it worked. So my sophomore year, I had a decent year. Um, and I remember, I think it was me and uh, Tyler Ennis. And we had like identical stats. And he was at Syracuse and I was at Wichita. He ended up getting drafted, I think, in the first round. But um, I really wanted to leave after my sophomore year. That was the first time scouts and agents started to come around. But uh, I missed a buzzer beater uh, against Kentucky. 
um, in the tournament. And I was just like, man, I can't let that be the, the end of my college career. Like, that's crazy. So um, I end up coming back. Um, and then my junior year, again, I wanted to leave again. But I was I was the man at Wichita. Like, I was living really good in school. Uh, we had a great program. And I just wanted to make it back to the Final Four. So I ended up staying um, all four years uh, just because my experience was so um, fun and good in college. And I didn't really want to leave that to go, uh, you know, take a chance at the league when I wasn't sure. Should I feel that? I was at UCLA. I felt like I took a pay cut because I went to the league, got drafted, <laughs> and then got cut and went to the and went to the motherfucking D League. I'm like, bro, I'd rather be in Westwood than this bullshit for real. <laughs> exactly. You said it. For real. You declared for the draft in 2016. You went undrafted. I know what that's like. I got I got drafted second to last pick and got cut immediately. Didn't even get a chance to play. So I know what that's like. You turned two. You turned down two offers to the D League too. It's 20000 for two years. What was your mind frame doing all that? Like, were you thinking, like, I still got a lot to prove or maybe it's not for me? No, I was just trying to figure out an angle to get in the door. Like, I saw, so, you know, I did, I really was just mad at my agent, to be honest, because I did 18 draft workouts. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I went and did 18 different teams in 30 days. So I was on the road for a whole month just trying to get a crack at it. And then, like, the day before the draft, he like, oh, you know you might not get drafted, right? And I'm like, well, what the fuck did I just do all that for? So uh, we had to we had to adjust, and it was just a matter of, like, finding a good summer league team um, and seeing somewhere where I could showcase and, and, and get it off at. Um, that team ended up being Toronto, and they was up front. They was like, listen, you know, you got a chance to make the team. Um, we're going to bring you to training camp. You're going to get a shot. And we're like, all right, bet. That's it. That's all I need. And then everything just kind of kind of fell, in, fell into my lap after that. You know, unfortunately for him, but fortunate for me, DeLon Wright had got hurt in summer league. He tore his shoulder up, so he was out like six months. Um, Coach Casey, he liked to keep three point guards, so I ended up being a third point guard. Um, at the time, and then once I got to training camp, it was it was a wrap. After that, because I was too I was too hungry, and at the same time, they needed somebody to push Kyle, and I just ended up being that guy to come in the door first day. It just you know I was I was at Kyle neck, and I think he respected it, and everybody else respected it. You hear yeah. about how hard, my bad, Jack, how hard Boy. Kyle works, and uh, you know what kind of leader he is. What did you learn um, under him um, as you were under not under him like that, but you like under his kind of tutelage as a young player? Because, like I said, he's known around the league for, you know, the work he puts in and how hard he plays. And I love to hear from day one, you was at his neck. Yeah. So like he was just the, the ultimate pro in terms of that guy who is going to do everything that you think you're supposed to do. He's going to do that and some. So like I was always a a you know, a polished, come come in early, stay late kind of guy. So I, I just remember, you know, training camp, I get there like two hours before practice. He he already done working out with the Norman Tech on his leg. So he done been in there three, four hours early already. So I'm like, damn, okay, this is what it takes. Now, he wasn't working that hard in camp, you know what I mean? He was a vet, but he would come in super early, get his work done, and then, you know, he would chill. So um, I just learned, like, everything, everything that I know really in the league, like, I learned a lot from Kyle and not – not really about my game, but just y'all know how it go, like how to move, um, mm -hmm. business things, family things, um, you know, how to work out, just your your routine, you know, how to how to recover. Um, he just he just taught me so lot and uh, taught me so much. And it was him and uh, him and Demar. So I kind of had like the yin and the yang because Demar is, mm -hmm. is totally different from Kyle. Um, and uh, I just got the best of both worlds with both of them. I think what you said right there is important, though, because I kind of feel like, you know, as you're like a vet on the team now, although you learn from some OGs, the game doesn't have that very much anymore. And you said it wasn't so much about your game. It was everything else. And I feel like that's what gets fucked up and missing for some of these young players. They don't get a chance to learn everything else, how to carry yourself, how to recover, what do's and don'ts, how to move. And I feel like, you know, Jack and I brought it up early in the interview. I feel like that's kind of what's missing. So it's dope that you got to learn under two 
pro pro and, and two vets. Yeah, it is, it is what missing. But at the same time, the guys who's making these decisions, they don't know. So it's like no. these front office people, they really don't understand that aspect of the locker room. Um, and they don't really care. Like at the end of the day, because they, they oh, are, facts. they're, they're going to let you trip and stumble and fumble. They're not even going to say nothing. They just going to sit back. They're going to, they're going to sit back and watch like, all right, yeah, he's an idiot. And then they're going to cut you when it's time to cut you Ooh, or not extend you. You know what I'm straight saying? Up. So they they move towards with the two-way contracts and, and they're moving towards giving these younger guys opportunity, which is good as well. But there's a huge part of the game that's missing, which is like teaching these young kids how to be men and teaching them how to right. be men inside the NBA. And um, I'm seeing it, obviously, because we have a really young team, but I'm just happy that I did have that. Like I had a lot of vets when I when I came into the league. Yep. When you uh, signed with the Raptors after summer league, and uh, did you ever think you have to go play in the D league? Yeah, so they told me like that was, you know what I mean? That, so this is how it was presented, like 50,000 for the training camps. I'm like, all right, cool. 50 G's, I'll take that. You know, no problem. Right. It's like 50, right. these 50, if you get cut, then you're going to run a G League team. In my head, I'm like, I'm not even going to make it that far. I'm going to make the team. So I didn't I didn't right. really think that far ahead. But when the opportunity came, I'm like, all right, man, I'm going to go down here. I'm going to kill. I'm going to shoot 30 times. Ooh, ooh, and then I'm going to come back. But we had Stack. Stack was our coach. Stackhouse was our was our coach. So when I went down there, it was like I went back to college. You know what I mean? Stack wasn't he wasn't just letting me rock out like shoot the ball a hundred times and just get your shit <laughs> off. Like he was like, no, you're gonna play the right way. And um, me and him had you know our back and forth and um, our relationship grew. And uh, he just taught me a lot as far as like you know how how that era y'all era of basketball see the game. And he come from a, a long line, a lineage of great coaches and people that he's played alongside. So I just got to soak up all of that game. But it made me sharp. Like the G League made me made me. Uh, uh, that's really what made me like go play. Like I don't give a fuck about nothing because yeah. I didn't I didn't been down there. And when you down there, you have to have that mentality. Mm -hmm. Like you can't. Mm -hmm. You can't go down there trying to be cute and 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 just get through the game because it's you can't win. Like if you go down there and you play the right way, you had ten points. They're gonna be like, man, you only had ten points. If you go down there and you score forty, they're gonna be like, ah, it was the G League. You know what I'm saying? Like that. So it's right, no way to right. win. So that that kind of made my mind even more sharper. It just made me like, when I get my chance, I'm gonna just go for it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I had to experience that. Like I said, I, I got drafted and went to the, it was the D-League back in. That shit was fucking terrible. Yeah. You know? so, I mean, there was already that chip of, but it like, I'm thinking, I'm talking back, oh, two. So we were bussing everywhere, nasty hotels, eating horrible. And I'm just like, this is not for me. And that yeah. was like the, the all the fire I needed. Like after that, fuck that. I was on mission. You know what I mean? I ended up, you know, playing 14 years in the league, but it's sometimes it takes that. You know what I mean? It takes that fire, that fuck you, either me or you. And you know what I mean? That's 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 what made me appreciate everything. Like I say, I, I love you because I, I could tell you play every game like it's your last because you you had to get it out the mud. You weren't a lottery pick. You weren't, mm -hmm. it wasn't sweet for you. You know what I mean? And that's really yeah. for all of us on, on, on this screen right now is the way we play was because of the way we brought up in this game. You know what I mean? I'm not even talking about childhood, but I'm talking about like it wasn't handed to us at the beginning. So that's why we can surpass some of these number one picks or lottery picks or first round picks because they're not hungry. They don't know what that other side is like. Exactly. No, you you, you said it. And I got that. It's crazy because like um, I never met an NBA player or seen an NBA game until I was damn near in my 20s, you know, when I was in college. So like I just had to study everything that I could get interviews, um, DVDs. I remember they used to have an NBA crossover DVD. I used to have that. Um, and I just remember I was a real young kid and I seen uh, AI do an interview and he was talking about like, you know, at the end of the day, I could live, you know, knowing that I did it my way. And mm -hmm. he said that. And then he also said, I go out there and play every game like it's my last. And like, I remember I, I couldn't have been nothing but like eight or nine years old. But like that stuck with me to this day. And, and I really try to try to play like that. So um, mm -hmm. I think that that make a big difference when you're out there because you're not you playing with a pure heart and you're really leaving it all on the line. And um, it's not that many that do that, you know, these days. No, but the ones, the ones that do the, those, those are the special ones. You know, they stand out. What was uh what was your welcome to the NBA moment? Uh I had a few, but the first one was um preseason. 
preseason, um, again, I was trying to make the team. It was like our second to last preseason game. We playing the Clippers, uh, CP, Blake, and all them. I was like, like I said, I was a third point guard. So, you know, I usually ain't checking in until like the second half of the game. And I, me and Kyle, we're not really that that close at this time. So I didn't know he wasn't playing. You know, our guys don't play all the preseason games. So we stand in the huddle, um, Case drawing up the play, and he write my name on the board. This before the tip off. And I'm looking like, fuck, like, yeah, y'all weren't gonna tell me I was starting. So boom. So I'm 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 taking <laughs> I'm taking my warm-up and stuff off. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to get ready. So I'm like, all right, bet. So now I'm out there, I'm nervous as hell. And uh this Chris Paul, you know what I'm saying? This is this mm-hmm. is CP for me. This is like this is good as it gets. So man, he wasn't even shooting. I think he had like 13 points at halftime. He was double crossing me, spinning me around. They used to run the uh, the little high, the little high double drag at the top, uh, uh, Blake yeah. and, and DJ. And he yeah. was rejecting. I was trying, man, I was spinning around. <laughs> I was so lost. And I just remember being in, in the locker room at halftime. I'm just like, whew, yeah, this is this is a different level right here. He said, whew. Because <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't even like trying to score. He wasn't he even was kill just, mode either. No, yeah, he, he wasn't even, even in kill, kill mode. mode. He but yeah. he knew that I was a rookie, so he was like, he was letting me know, you know what I'm saying? And, right. and um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't that many guys that's done me like that. But CP definitely he he got me. <laughs> <laughs> so outside of your team, I mean, it may be what you just said, but outside of your teammate, uh, any of your teammates, who were you in awe of when you first came in the league? <sighs> definitely, um, definitely Brian. Um, definitely KD. Um, definitely Steph, Kyrie. Um, yeah, those those guys. But it's like it was really my first half of my rookie year because I was on the bench. So when I was on the bench and I knew I wasn't playing, I could just I could just enjoy the game. Like I ain't, you know, mm-hmm. what I'm saying I, I ain't really in compete mode. Like. When I'm on the court, I'm hating on everybody. Like, man, that bum mask move, man. I was <laughs> right. lucky. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm I'm hating. But when I'm on the bench, I'm watching, I'm like, yo, like these dudes, they big, bro. Like, these is like yeah. real giants. Uh that was Porzingis when Porzingis still had his uh his buzz around him in New York. Um, just like seeing how big guys was and just how agile and just how special they was to touch. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a lot of guys early on, but then once I started playing, I, you know, I didn't really look at it like that. Mm-hmm. 2018, 2019, what was the team like headed into that season? We was all kind of like, uh, still trying to figure out, you know, what it was going to be. Um, because up until that point, like all we had heard was obviously we traded DeMar, which was a big deal. You know, this is, this is DeMar. This is the realest dude that I've ever met in, in this world in terms of, you know, the basketball world and professional world. Like, this is a real dude. He he gets it. Mm-hmm. Um, we trade him. So I'm like, damn, how, like, how does this, how this go? Like, this the dude, this is the, this guy dedicated his world to this team and y'all trade him like that. And then only thing we seen was Kawhi don't want to come. He don't want to be here. He don't want to be here. So, you know, me, I'm looking like, well, shit, we don't, we don't want you then, bro. You don't want to be here. Like, <laughs> it is what it Thanks. is. You know what I'm saying? But, Again, we didn't know. I, we never spoke to him. I never met him. When he came, it was all love. He came and he he, he worked his butt off. He was a uh, he's a special special talent, a special individual. And um, from the day first day of training camp, we knew we had a chance to win a championship. Like when you know, you just know. It's just a feeling in the gym. Everybody know it. The trainers know it. You know the, the coaches know it. The, the staff know it. And um, I think everything just aligned to that. And I think we made the trade for Marcus Saul like halfway through. So that just added a little bit more. Um, but yeah, that was that was one of them things where it's like we just had to make it to the end because we knew we had a chance. From the outside looking in, uh, Jack got to play with a young Kawhi. I never got to play with him. I got to play against him. What is he like when you actually like in practice and in the locker room and that kind of shit? Because he gives off one persona kind of similar to how mm-hmm. Kobe was. And then when I got a chance to really know Kobe, it was night and day of what everyone thought of him. Yeah, no, same, same thing. You got it. Like, like Kawhi was was super regular. He was super regular. Like, now he ain't the dude that's gonna walk in the room and dap everybody. Yo, hey, oh, what's up, y'all? What's going on? Like, he ain't doing nah. that. But if you if you go to him and try to bust it up with him, he gonna have a convo with you. And he's actually mm-hmm. he's super funny. He's super regular. <laughs> he like to do all the shit that we like to do. He just don't tell mm-hmm. nobody about it. He don't play social mm-hmm. media. 
and he don't he don't like doing a bunch of interviews. Um, and the one thing that I took from him was that he would come in and he would do his workout. And that's the only time that I saw like the robot thing where like he would I would see him take 30 pull up jumpers going right at the same speed, like like clockwork, clockwork, clockwork. He going the same speed. You know what I'm saying? He's not going fast. He's just going at his pace. He getting to his spot. He pulling up. He going to his spot. He pulling up. He not missing. So I just I used to just sit on the side and just watch him work out just mm-hmm. to see like what his process was. He didn't practice a lot. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't a big shoot around guy, practice guy. But when it was time to play, man, he was uh he's he's on a different level. Like and and mm-hmm. the thing that I took from him the most was he put fear in everybody's heart on the other team. So mm-hmm. when when we walk in that gym, we knew we had the best best player on the floor almost every single night. And it's only probably one or two guys that I've seen felt like they had to, you know, had that edge with him. Um, but other than that, like, he put fear in a lot of people's hearts who a lot of people think is big dogs. Kawhi put fear in their hearts. And I've seen that, mm. you know what I mean, mm. at, early. So, mm-hmm. Social media was buzzing when uh, doing post in the postseason when you was uh, balling and uh, you had your son. I know that's what that's the reason we do it. Uh, was that a what, what was your feeling doing that? I know that was extra motivation for you, but you know social media was going crazy around that time. Yeah, so like I was struggling before that in the Philly series. You know, the Philly was a bigger team. My minutes got pulled down. I wasn't making. I was getting like two shots a game. I wasn't making them. So now I'm like 0 for 14 in the playoffs. Yeah, you out of the rotation. So I struggled that series. We end up winning this series. Um, my girl and my family was at home because we had my I had my daughter in Toronto, but I had my son, you know, at the crib. So they was in the States and I was in Toronto. So around that time when he got ready to come, I was able to go home, be there for the birth, um, you know, see my baby girl, see my family. And it just it just put me at ease. So when I went back, it was just time. It was time for me to play good, obviously. But I think just mentally it put me at ease. And uh, yeah. once 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 I got hot, it was it was over, and it was like a perfect moment because up until that point, I don't think really Kawhi was really trusting us like that because we wasn't giving him a real reason to. So once I started making shots, his trust grew. Then he started drawing. He started like driving to pass instead of driving to score mm-hmm. and drawing the defense in, kicking out. And you know, I was we was knocking him down, and and that's really when we took off. Mm-hmm. Before you got to the finals, you played the Sixers. What, what was going through the, the mind of Kawhi putting up that final shot in Game Seven? Like I, we all knew he was taking the shot. We knew the ball was going to him. But did y'all did you expect him to to, to force it like he did? Uh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah we knew we knew it we knew what it was. Uh, I, we he liked that right baseline. Um, getting to that spot, uh, I was more so surprised that they let him get that far. You know what I'm saying? Like I was thinking they was gonna trap him. He was gonna have to try to shoot over a double team or pass it. But he ended up getting all the way over there. I was like on the bench when he shot it, and um, it looked like it was off at the like from my angle when it bounced a couple of times. It went in. It was just for me in my head. I'm thinking like, yes, I get another series to redeem myself. <laughs> if this shit would have ended here, boy, that would have like my whole my whole trajectory would have changed. You know what I'm saying? As far as like that would have been my playoff experience. I would have never got the chance to have a great series in Milwaukee, have a great finals. Like, you know, we might not have be calling me NBA champ today if, if we don't get out of that series. So um, I was just happy. I think everybody was just happy because that was a tough, tough, tough Philly team. Um, and he made that shot. And again, that's a that's a special dude. Kawhi special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you definitely get to get a chance to find your rhythm. Now you're in the finals against a dynasty and someone you looked up to come into league, the Golden State Warriors. What was your mentality at that point? Well, the conversation going into it, because I had guarded Steph a few times before, like in the regular season, I had like some success. And when I say success, like I guarded him better than most people guard him. I still ain't, I ain't going to sit up here and say I lock lock Steph up. I ain't ain't, going to say that. But I guarded him better than most people do. Like I'm not going to. I'm not going to go under when it's when I need to go over. I'm not going to fall asleep and let them get a wide open shot. So like um they came to me like, "Yo, you going you going to guard Steph? That's going to be your assignment. Just do the best you can." I'm like, "All right, bet." 
And I watched a ton of film. I seen where guys go wrong. We had a great game plan. Obviously, Kevin wasn't out there, so that changes things. Now we really going to load up. And then, you know, when Clay went down, now we really going to load up. And and mm. if, if you could beat if you could beat us by yourself, you deserve it, bro. But I don't think that 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 team that we had, it wasn't like one person that could have beat us. So um, I just try to lock in on, on my assignment. And um, me being so locked in defensively, it made me more aggressive on offense because I was working too hard. So when I got the ball, I'm like, yeah, I got to get my shit off because I'm, I'm working way too hard on defense. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so you mentioned, uh, you know, KD being out, but then he comes back. I forget what the game is for. And he came off, came in, you know, and he was cooking, you know, like he had never been injured. What was your guys' mindset knowing that game that KD – Came back, started playing well, and obviously he went down again. But what was your guys' approach knowing that, okay, man, they got they got another weapon back this game? Yeah, well, we had to adjust a little bit as far as game plan goes, I, obviously. But um, me personally, I was just like, nah, we got a special dude. This dude is special, too, to go from not mm-hmm. – I think he came out, he made like four threes in a row. Um, we knew he wasn't 100%, so we was going to test him. When he switched, we was going to drive him, like test his leg out, things like that. And I think that's actually how he ended up getting hurt. Yep. He closed out on Surge, and Surge, you know, attacked him. Um, mm-hmm. So we was just trying to test him and, and make sure that, you know, if he was going to be out there, we was going to make him work. Um, but, nah, he he gave him a boost in that game five uh, that they needed, and they ended up uh, winning that game, obviously. But, um no, Kevin. Yeah, he's he he on a different level for sure. Yeah, um, he a just, monster. Yeah, he he's a he's an animal. Yeah. So you guys end up taking the series four to two, and bring the first championship back to Toronto. What was that feeling like? It was crazy. It was a, like a, this all the emotions that you can think of. You know what I mean? When you win one, it's just it, you go from like your personal journey to you know your childhood to everything you've been through up until this point to professionally. Um, I had struggled. You know what I mean? I. I, I, uh, I was on social media when I was struggling. So I was getting like all the death threats and you ain't shit and all the comments yeah. and all that. And then to be able to turn it around and, and to win one, like, you know, you just feel like you prove everybody wrong in life. And um, for a city like Toronto, where we come home to the parade and there's two million people or whatever it is, like, mm, it's man. just, it's just like stuff that they make movies about. And um, just to be in that moment and to be a part of it, not to just be in it, but to be a part of it, to score in the fourth quarter, to make the big shots, the big plays, like mm-hmm. coming from where I come from, that was, that was crazy. And it's something that I never forget. And, it's like, you know, I'm trying to work so hard so I can get back and do it again because it was such a such a crazy moment. Mm-hmm. So you guys are able to close out into the Bay. You guys jet off to Vegas to enjoy yourselves, then head home to the parade. Uh, any stories that stand out to you that you can share? I know some stories can't yeah. be shared, but <laughs> anything you can share with us? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean... Yeah, like when we just just from the parade standpoint, like I just remember it was a it was like a morning parade, like a night. We got on the bus at like eight or nine o'clock. And, um, you know, we really was only going like, you know, on a regular day, maybe what, 10 minutes, you know what I mean? From where we started at to where we get to end up being like a four hour trip. You know, they had to stop the bus. People was running on the street. We drinking. And before you know it, we get onto the stage for the thing. And it's just only like one o'clock or something like that. And we wasted. Like, I'm like, damn, I ain't even know you could like, you know what I'm saying? I didn't even know you could do that much in that little time. But we on the bus and it's just like, it's funny, man, because that's why I keep like a lot of my close friends and family around from when I was a little boy, because they keep me grounded. So it's like uh, coming from where I come from to be on the bus with, it's me, Kyle Lowry, Drake, and Kawhi. You know what I'm saying? I got my girl. I got my my girls, my mother-in-law. I got my brother. Like we on that's that's the bus that we on. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like, man, you can't you can't make that stuff up. And you know, it's just enjoying it, man, because that it's it's hard to do. It's real hard to do. Nothing like a championship uh, parade, man. We all we all had a chance to experience that championship parade. I I vividly remember me still being drunk from the night before. After the game, so I don't even yeah. remember too much of the parade because I was hung <laughs> over out my body. I still yeah. have my uniform on too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's nothing like it, man. That's that's probably one of the best best moments, you know, of my life for sure. 
you mentioned uh, being on the uh, on the bus with Drake. Just for a moment, how important is he to not only the team and 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 fucking with y'all, but just the city overall? I don't think we've seen a person be such an ambassador for one place like we've seen Drake, and he's got his hands with your team. I seen him just call Adam, uh, called Adam Silver out, said he wants a WNBA team. Like, what 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 is it like being around him and the energy he brings to you guys? Uh, he's just an icon. He's just an icon, really, like, in the world. And I think that he's so much of a nice dude and just a genuine dude that when you're around him, you don't really notice it. You know what I'm saying? Because he's really a fan, for real, like, and not in a bad way. Like, he really is a fan of the game. Um, he's a fan of this team. He comes from this city. Like, you could see the, you know what I mean? This dude got his, he got his owl right here, like, on the, <laughs> on the, on the NBA crazy. team. Like, he got a court. Yeah. He got a jersey. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's that's unheard of. And um, mm-hmm. to come from, you know, the hometown where he come from to do this and to do it with his team and his family and his friends that he, that he grew up with, like, it's just inspirational for me. I think it's the blueprint for what a lot of guys should be striving to do. Um, and he goes out into the world and he reps it. And um, he's just a huge ambassador for not only the game, but obviously for this city and, and for Toronto. And I think I, I caught the wave like at a great time in my first six years because I could see the growth, you know, from year to year. Um, they did the Slam magazine with DeMar and Kyle. And then it just stepped, it just started building and building from there. And I just kind of been in the middle of it. And the championship was like the peak of that. And then, you know, at the games, he just he he he's he wilding out. He's a he's a fan, man. He over he's trash talking, he talking crazy to the player, to the refs. He rubbing, you know, Nick's shoulders during the game. Like he just he just having fun, <laughs> man. So like he just he just enjoying it, man. It's, it's it's like a it's like a playground for him. Right. I yeah. love it. Uh, so the following season, Kawhi announces he's not returning. He's going to join the Clippers. Were you guys surprised at all? Did you kind of know what the vibe was with him post? Did you know he's going to be in and out? Um, no, we was following it like y'all. Like, again, I wasn't the dude, like, me and Kawhi wasn't really, like, super tight. So I wasn't the guy who was going to, like, keep chasing him. Like, hey, yo, what you doing? What's going on, bro? I just respected him. We had a mutual respect. Um, him and Kyle was a little bit closer. Um, so we was following it like everybody else. I knew he was meeting with us. He was meeting with the Clippers. It was a couple of things. I couldn't see him going to the Lakers, but I could see the Clipper thing happening. Um, and I think I was in the club. I think it was, uh, my, my best friend's, uh, bachelor party or something. I was in the club like the night before free agency. And, um, we got a text, we got a group text, you know, from Kawhi. Yo, hey, y'all, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going home. Woo woo. It's like, all right, bet. 30 seconds later, the tweet started coming out that he was going to the Clippers. Like, all right, man, you can't do nothing but respect it, man. Thank you for, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? The year that you gave here, he was number professional. He 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 carried us a lot. You know what I'm saying? And I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. I learned a lot from him. And you just gotta keep it a hundred at all times, man. He was he was great. Thanks. I I enjoyed it. You can't be mad at him for that. I think that if he did would have came back, we would have won a couple of them, like at least a back to back for sure. But yeah, yeah. The first thing I thought about was, all right, bet it's time to get paid now. I don't have to like mm-hmm. try to try to like Oh yeah, I gotta play my role for a winning team. No, it's time to take a step up. Like he's leaving, it's time for me to take a step up and grow. So, mm-hmm. um, it's nothing but love for Kawhi always. Yeah, I want to take a I want to take a step back though because, like you said, uh, you spoke to our brother about our brother Demar, and I think he gave so much to that franchise, and it just happened to be, you know, he gets traded, you guys win. But before you guys win this championship and he gets traded, what was the energy like and what was your thought process because you're fairly young in the process like what was it like because you said he was a consummate pro someone you looked up to someone you so game up from someone that did so much for that franchise what was it like when he was actually traded well I was hurt you know what I mean personally like I was hurt like I really you know I'm one of those guys who like I, I you know I told you like my high school stories and all like I put my heart into this for real every day and the guys that I get close to like these are gonna be my guys for life it's not just for fake or for work because we play together like so that's really my guy like that's really my big brother so and I was with him in Vegas so like some of the stories that he told about how I went down I was with him like for some of that you know what I'm saying so when that happened it was just like damn like it's a cold game you know what I'm saying and at the same time I'm gonna miss this dude because he did a lot for me 
he did a lot for me and I learned a lot from him. And I felt like it really wasn't his fault. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not a, I'm not a big trade guy. And maybe I'll get there as, you know, I get older in this league, but I'm not really big on trades like that because there's so much going on in the business of basketball that it's easy to just point at one player or, you know, a player and say, we need to trade. So I wasn't a fan of the trade. Um, obviously it worked out and they looked like geniuses after the fact, but, um, no, I was, I was just, I was upset. You know what I'm saying? I was hurt behind that because this is, this is, this is the guy for us. And he was so much of a real dude that it was just like, damn, how could you, how could you trade him? But you know what I'm saying? We end up winning championship off of it. So when you look back, um, you have a different memory of it, but in that moment, yeah, I was, I was a little fucked up behind that one. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Uh, know your worth. November 2020, you signed $85 million deal for four years. You made history by signing the largest contract an undrafted player has ever received. I'm rich, Ooh. bitch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Run it up. What was your feeling? <laughs> what, what was your feeling that day? Because I, you know, like I said, we we as hoopers, we can remember, you know, certain instances or situations in our life. You know, uh, we get that call and saying we got that money or we sign our line, our name on the contract, and we we know we got the money. What was your feeling like the day you got the $85 million contract? Man, like I was in heaven. Like, like, like it was just an out-of-body experience. Um, mm -hmm. Knowing what I put into the game and, and all the sacrifices that I made and just doing it with integrity and just trying to be a, a, a real soldier like all the way through. Like it was a lot of times I could have did a lot of sucker shit that I never did. So it was like to be rewarded for that, like that's something that that made me feel proud of myself. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't really give myself a lot of pats on the back because I'm so focused on where I'm trying to get to. But I was just... I was just like, it was an out-of-body experience. You know what I'm saying? I had all my boys with me. We, we drove up, we met them in Chicago and we signed the, the, the paper. Um, yeah, it was, that was a, it was a crazy moment. And um, just the negotiating process, you know, I learned a lot as far as how free agency goes and how they even get to those numbers and things like that. So um, I know my worth and I, and I felt like I was worth a lot more. So I also had to, I also had to, to have that, you know, realization where we see a lot of guys you know, strike out because they thinking like that ain't the number, right? So it's like, you know what I'm saying? I, I had that moment where it was like, I can't, I can't say no to this. Like, I don't, we'll, we'll worry about the, the number on the next one. So mm -hmm. I, I signed it and, you know, that was like the biggest day of my life for, for me and my family and just having that generational wealth. You know, I got two children. I got a, a big family. I take care of a lot of people. So I know what I could do with that money and I know what that money means for my city, for my family and, and going forward for generations. Like I know, I know what that's going to do. And it just, it allowed me to be like a real NBA player now, because up until that point, I was just, I was just grinding, 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 trying to get a big deal so I could like relax. You know what I'm saying? So I could sleep at night because what I got before it was like, it was cool, but you know, this is the first time I felt like I got my due respect and, and um, you know, my appreciation. And they, they showed that with the, with the deal. That's dope. I mean, it's almost been a year. I mean, we in November now, you know, it was 2020 when you signed it. But I'm mean, again, oh, like I said, being a fan of you and your approach and not really knowing your upbringing and your grind, it made me feel that much better now, even knowing what you went through, that you got that bread. Because like I said, there's, there's always the underdogs and rarely do the underdogs get to eat the way you ate. You know what I mean? So we just definitely want to give you a shout out and a congratulations, man, because you're your journey is more attainable than a LeBron James or a Kevin Durant type journey. Like you were a real blue collar grinder, got it out the mud type motherfucker. And you could be very inspirational for a lot of people, man. So again, we wanted to congratulate you on that money, man. Cause like you said, that's, that's lifetime wealth. And that's just the first one. You got yeah, at least another, another, another two coming up. Yeah. Facts. No, that's, that's what it is. And it's just like, I do this for a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? I don't really speak for everybody or like, you know, my story is not for everybody, but the people that it is for, like, this is, you know, it's, it's the motivation and it's the inspiration to just keep doing it this way and trying to do it the right way. And just like, it is light at the end of the tunnel. Cause I mean, you guys know how this game is. It's a dirty game and you could get mixed up and caught up in a lot of the, the bullshit. And, and, um, you know, it was just, it was just a blessing. It's just a blessing, man. I'm, I wake up every day. I'm, I'm super blessed and, and humbled to be in this position. But again, like, you know, I, I'm very ambitious and I want I want to do a lot more personally and, you know, 
as far as family and just, you know, winning more and doing a whole bunch of more shit. Do you ever reflect back on your draft party now where you were pa- passed over in two different rounds, not really getting the respect or opportunity, and now kind of look back like, yo, like, like you said, I, I think sometimes as players in the moment, I think you said earlier, we never really get to appreciate what we accomplish or what we go through because we're so caught up in the moment. But were you able to just kind of take a, a, a step back like, yo, I know I'm here and I, I've made it. I got a lot more to do, but I, I, I just did some shit. Yeah, it's just like confirmation. Like, it's just like um, validation. You know what I mean? Because when you that guy that's getting looked over your whole life, you always thinking like, man, they don't know what they talking about, man. They they need to look at me. Like, you always think that, but you never really know until you prove it. So when I go back and I look at that draft class, in my head, I'm like, how did they not know? Like, how did they not see that, you know what I'm saying, I deserve to be one of these 60 guys. Like, it was 60 guys, bro. Like, it's not 60 guys better than me. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. um, it was, it was, you know, you just take it with a grain of salt. And if I could go back and do it again, I wouldn't change a thing. Like, I would do it all over again because all of those things, they they made me who I am. And, um, you know, it's all just a part of the journey. But definitely, for sure, I look back like I knew I was right the whole time. You know what I'm saying? But you feel crazy in the moment because you you want that validation from from somebody else. And so uh, I would just tell people just to, you know, if that's what you believe, you just got to believe it until, you know what I mean, until the end. There's nothing else you could do. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to do a little reflecting uh, for you, but uh, you're the first player in Raptors history to score 30 and 10 in a playoff game. What does that mean to you? I mean, Vince Carter, DeMar, Kawhi, Kyle, None of them ever did that. Uh, when you hear that you're the only one, what does that mean to you? Again, I'll be so caught up in my own world. I don't even be paying attention to some of these <laughs> things. Like, I just, you know, I'm just trying to win the game. Like, I'm trying to win the game by any means necessary. And, you know, I'll be able to look at the accomplishments when I'm older and, and sit back and tell my kids about it. You know what I mean? Things like that. But, um the only one that I really was was stuck on was the 54 because uh, mm-hmm. because uh, I knew I watched DeMar, so I think he had 52. So I watched him have 52, and I'm like, damn, I remember watching him. Like, damn, I want to do that one day. And so I, I remember that one. But, the yeah, I don't know, man. I just I just go out there and try to, try to win every game and, and play my ass off. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Mm. And then one more. I mean, obviously you mentioned uh, the franchise scoring mark at 54. But you also hit a three pointer in thirty nine consecutive games. Again, probably didn't pay too much attention to it, but to 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 really have that kind of streak. I mean, all that shit is dope. But like you said, you can, you can sit back and look at it at a later time. But definitely understand and appreciate it in the moment as well. Yeah, uh, probably just more so like the work because I like I I really do the same thing like every day. You know what I'm saying? Off days, no days. Like I come in, I got my work routine. I come in before practice. I work out, get my treatment practice whatever shoot around so like just the constant work and the hours that I put in in the off season like I ain't not running around doing a bunch of wild shit like I'm really working on my craft and trying to get better um and I think it's one thing that keep me ahead especially at my size is like I just got to keep sharpening up my tool set and and just keep trying to get better each year because you can like when you get when you sign that 85 like there was a there was a few days where I just sat back like whew like I'm good, good. Like I ain't, I ain't, I can, I, can, I can average zero points for the next four years. They can't rip that contract up, bro. Like exactly, they gotta pay. Exactly. They gotta pay on the first or fifteenth. But, um, you know, I there's just something inside of me that just wants to keep getting better. So when I do these accomplishments, it's more so like it make me feel good because I know I worked on these things, um, mm-hmm. to get there. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you're someone that could people could look up to with your journey, as we touched on earlier. But what kind of advice would you give to someone who's been on your path? Just to keep going, you gotta be you gotta be a sicko, man. You gotta be like you gotta have the you gotta be that guy that people talk bad about. Like, who do he think he is? Why do he think he's so good? Like, why 
lets he have that much confidence. You have to be that guy. And you can't, you know, I don't I don't advise nobody to be an asshole, but I think that you should definitely be confident and be respectful in the same breath. But you got to just have this unwavering feel. And, you know, for me, I get validated by the work, like I said, because when I step on the court, it's I know it's not too many guys that's work harder than me. So when I'm on the court with KD, yeah, I feel like I'm the best player on the court. Now, I might be crazy, but guess what? That's going to allow me to even compete in the same breath and have some of them mm-hmm. same moments. So when I'm when I matched up on Steph, yeah, I feel like I'm just as good as him. And that's just that's just my mindset when I'm on the court. And we could argue about it all day after the fact. But for them two and a half hours when you're in between them lines, you got to have that type of belief in, and that type of dog in you. Otherwise, you don't stand a chance out there. Facts. Facts. Not at all. Me and Matt, we consider ourselves as being as real as possible because it's not really a situation that in life, especially as an athlete, that we haven't been through or we haven't touched on. You know what I mean? From making mistakes to all the good things to fatherhood. You know what I mean? And, and, and balancing life. We both contested that. Tell me how do you balance life? And, you know, also being a father, but also, you know, trying to perfect your craft every day and get better. It's a it's a process. It's a process, man. I ain't I definitely haven't figured it out in terms of, you know, making sure that everything's straight all the time. Like I stumble, I have my ups and downs just like anybody. But I think I just pride myself on being a real man, first and foremost, like just being a man first before anything, a father first before anything. And then everything else after that, I could figure it out. So I got a great support system. Um, you know, my girl, she take care of the house, take care of the kids flawlessly. I got a great family. Um, you know what I'm saying? I, I keep my brothers and my friends and my homies real tight. We got a real tight circle. So I got a great support system. I don't have too much, you know, bullshit that I got to deal with as far as distraction goes. Um, and they understand everybody play their position, but like I always been a leader. So ever since I was a little kid, I always been a leader. So I, I kind of got that point part of my life like in order so when stuff do come our way we can handle it how we handle it and you know i mean i go out there when i go to work i'm at work i take care of my business i'm gonna take this shit as far as i can take it by being myself and you know we'll we'll live the rest of it however it go but i really got it zipped up in terms of like just the organization and and like i'm able to have these conversations that's the biggest thing i would say is just being able to be a man allows me to communicate and have real conversations with people that are uncomfortable. Mm. You've been known for your crossover. Is that something you've been doing since you were young or uh, as uh, as time passed or as your game grew, you just actually start adding it to your, uh, to your game? No, I always had that. It used to be way more wild. Like I told you, I grew up, I was an AI guy, Kobe guy, the, the super big left to right. Um, me and my brothers, we used to watch N1. We had the N1 mixtapes. We had the N1 mixtape. We would plug the N1 mixtape in, watch it, go in the backyard, practice all the moves, come back out, go back in, watch it, you know, and practice. So, like, I used to be have a lot more, like, street ball to me. But um, as I got older, I started trying to polish it up a little bit more. And uh, you just got to have – you just got to have a lot of tricks in your bag at my size, man. And, and you know, you keep the fundamentals and the footwork with the feet. But – um, you know, I just try to just try to keep adding things and having different tools to to be able to get that separation. Yeah. How tall are you? I'm six foot, six one with shoes on. Ooh, damn, <laughs> that's dope. Crafty, that's crafty. Dope. Yes, sir. For real man. What what does Steve Nash say when you call him crafty? Is that another word for just calling me white? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, <laughs> man, hey, hey, but, hey, you know, Rico, Rico, Rico. You said it all the time. You got to have some crafties. You got to have some crafties. Yeah, you got to. You got, you got to, man. Shit, it's playing up there with all them trees and them giants, man. You better figure something out. Are you gonna be over there with a suit and tie on? <laughs> For real. <laughs> hey, but you guys, uh, you guys picked up one of my homeboys, one of my brothers on your coaching staff this year, Earl Watson. He was my UCLA point guard. Uh, great career. Uh, well, to me, one of the best basketball minds in the game. Have you got to sit down and, and, and kind of dev- uh, develop a relationship with him yet? Yeah, me and Earl, man, we we communicate every day. I'm chasing him around the gym, like, yo, yo. Tell me what's up, man. What, what I need to yeah. be doing, like where I where I need to get to. And he telling me different things that I never that I never heard before. You know what I'm saying? I'm mm-hmm. 27 years old. I'm still learning. Like, 
yo, just get to this angle on the floor. No, when you get here, turn this way and you could score at this spot on the floor. Like just different little simple things that he got. You know, he's got a great wealth of knowledge that that he's given me the game and he's not loud. You know what I'm saying? He, we and him, we talk. Uh, but no, nah, he's been great for me. I think that he really going to help me take my game to the next level because I'm a guy that I want to be coached. Like I want people to tell me when I'm doing something wrong or tell me where I could be doing something better at. And from the day he got here, I went straight to him. I said, listen, bro, I don't know who you coached before, but you can come to me. Tell me everything that you see because because I, I, I want to learn it all. I think that's dope because he had that same relationship with Devin Booker. Yep. Devin Booker still to this day Ooh. credits Earl for his development and his mindset. And Earl's one of those real sharp minds, man. So I hope you enjoy him because I have a feeling he's going to get another head coaching job soon. But it definitely soak up the game while you can from him. Yeah, no, for sure. He, he's sharp as shit. Yeah. Um, I mean, shit, you're only six years in, but you're a vet. Uh, do you have a young player you enjoy watching now? And if so, uh, who is it and why? Um... In the league, you know who I like? I like LaMelo, man. I like LaMelo, man. Like, and it's not really nothing to do with his game or anything. I just like his swag. Like, his swag is crazy. Like, LaMelo, I love LaMelo and uh, uh, what's the other boy? Uh, Anthony Edwards in Minnesota. Ooh. Like, they Ooh. swag is just so crazy, man. That's what I was speaking about. Like, they don't care about nothing, they, mm-hmm. they do their interviews. They talking how they talk in real life and in their interviews, they carrying it every day. And it's like nothing you can do but respect it. You know what I'm saying? And I think that with that talent and, the, and the, you know, the way that the game is going, I think it's just going to keep getting more better and better. Um, but there's a lot of guys. I actually, you know, obviously I'm going to give a shout out to my rook, um, Scotty Barnes, who who has mm-hmm. he's balling. Been, yeah, he's been balling in his first, you know, 10, 11 games. And just the spirit and the energy for the game that he has. He's a really good kid and he really loved the game and he's just happy to be here. And I hope that that's something that he never lose because his talent level is crazy. Mm, love it. Now, question, you mentioned Anthony Edwards. Can you give me and Jack your point of view when he dunked on your teammate? My goodness. Hey, is your, <laughs> hey where's your teammate hey. now? Is he alive? Hey. Hey, the yeah. first thing this nigga, hey, the first thing this nigga did was rub his head and rub his eyes, like, oh shit, here we go. Yeah, so, so I'm gonna do this as best as I can, cause, cause, cause Yuta is actually my man. You know, I'm, I'm real hard on him, but he my man. So, right. I'm gonna tell you, I've been telling him, yo, you gotta be early outside the box when you go be the help on a low man. You got to, dog. You can't keep waiting. What you waiting on? You got to meet them outside the box because when these motherfuckers jump, they not mm. coming down, man. They not. <laughs> so I have been telling them. So I was on the, I was, you know, for the COVID rules, they spread the bench out. So I was actually behind the goal. So I couldn't see, but I was looking up. I was looking up at the Jumbotron. Mm. And man, they threw that there, man. That boy jumped over him so hard. And I was just like, damn, I thought he like broke his neck or something. I was looking <laughs> and I just was like, Shh. I was just shaking my head like, man, I said, I told you, I told you got to be early. You got to right. be early. So we, 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 you know, we joke with him all the time about it. Uh, he's a good sport. And he was like, shit, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going every That's time. Right. That's what he said. That's right. I, said, sure. right. I, I, I respect it, bro. I respect it, but you you, you, you got your ass dunked on, but I respect it. (laughs) (laughs) All right, man. Well, here we go, man. We're winding down to the end of the interview. Let you get on with the rest of your day. We got quick hitters. First thing to come to mind, let us know. Toughest player you've had to guard to date? Kyrie. Ooh, good call. Nice, nice. One of probably my favorite. Uh, Top five guards of all time? Point guards. Ooh. Point guards, yeah. Top five point guards. Top five point guards of all time. Yeah, my bad. Let's, let's uh, test your knowledge. Man. So I'm gonna say this first before I give you my answer. I'm not going that far back because I'm a young, I'm a young guy. Like I yeah, ain't going, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Not that's going okay. There. But we'll I'm gonna that. say, I'm gonna say Isaiah Thomas, Detroit Pistons, Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna say CP3. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say Steph. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say, uh, damn. I'm gonna say, uh, ooh, wee, y'all killing me with this one. <laughs> I'm gonna say, uh, yeah, AI at two. I would put AI in there. AI at two. I ain't, he ain't no point guard. Um, I'm gonna put, uh, I'm gonna put Chauncey Billups in there. 
Ooh, I like yeah. And I'm gonna put uh, I'm gonna probably put I'm gonna probably put J Kid in there. Um, yeah, solid. That's solid. Yeah, I'm gonna probably put J Kid in there. I'm not putting Magic in there. Magic six nine. I, I love Magic. I'm not putting him on my point guard list. Um, but he definitely yeah. be on like greatest of all time list. But not not on my point guard list. Yes, nice. What album can you listen to on repeat with no skips? Ooh. Album. Probably some rose. I'm gonna say uh Rick Ross, uh Teflon Don. Mm-hmm. He, nice. He about, dro- nice. He about to drop another album soon, too. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. yeah, coming out real soon. Five dinner guests, dead or alive. Five dinner guests. Mm-hmm. Yep. Dead, dead or alive. Dead or alive. <sighs> Prince. Um Tupac. Uh, Muhammad Ali. Nice. Um, Malcolm X. Tough. Uh, that's four, right? I need one more. Yeah. Um, Kobe. Mm. Man, that's mm. a main mm. one. That's me. That's probably one of our best ones right there. I'm going to bring the weed. We're going to enjoy that dinner. <laughs> yeah, man, for real. That's going to be nice. You're going to learn something. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, this is a title I used to hold, but I've passed it on to my young fellas. Top three hairlines in the NBA right now. Jason Tatum said you're in his top three. What's your top yeah, three in the no, league he, right now? He, he, yeah, yeah, he's me, definitely top three. Yeah, me, Tatum, and uh, DJ Augustine. Mm. Oh, hey, hey, you know what else I throw in there? DJ, mm. I play with DJ Augustine. He take his shit serious. Yeah, he but take Paul, it serious. He said he, I, he, he, I, I got to put him serious. on there. <laughs> Paul George, too. No, no, he, uh, no. See, uh, DJ, we got the same barber in Houston. DJ takes his hair serious, yeah, bro. No, nah, he official. He official. <laughs> <laughs> Paul George. Paul, hey, Paul George hairline still sitting on his eyebrows, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's all. I can't right put. There. I can't. I can't put PG in there because he, it's too low. Like he don't got to do that much work. Like he could just keep <laughs> right. it. Yeah. Anybody can edge that up. Yeah, facts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last question, man. If you could have one guest on All the Smoke, who would it be? But before you answer, you have to help us get your answer on the show. He looks just like you. He's the ambassador of your team. Just up. Uh, go ahead. Oh, say less. They call him the boy. They call him the boy. Yeah, I'm going to tell Drake to do it. I'm going to tell him. I'm going to yes, tell him. Sir. I'm going to tell him. Now yes, listen, sir. I can't I can't guarantee he gonna do it, but I'm gonna no, do it. No, you ain't gotta part. guarantee it. Yeah, yeah that's I all get, we ask. I'm a, but I'm a, I'm gonna I'm a shout out, shout out Nico and shout out OVO <laughs> Rocks. Hey, they both didn't hit me in the last two weeks. I talked to both of them, so I'm using all my pull. I'm going through you, I'm yeah, going through yeah. OVO Rocks, and I'm going through Nico. <laughs> yeah, I'm pa- hey, I'm I'm I'm, pass, I'm I'm gonna pass the word along, man. I'm gonna yes, pass the word sir. along. Yes, sir. Well, Fred, man, we appreciate your time, brother. We look up to you. We admire you. We're happy for you, man. Keep leading the way. Keep doing it the right way. And uh, best of luck the rest of the season, homie. No doubt. Thank you, guys. Appreciate y'all. Man, appreciate you, bro. Yeah, honey. That's a wrap. Fred Van Fleet, all the smoke. You can catch us on Showtime Basketball YouTube and the iHeart platform, Black Effects. We'll see y'all next week. Peace. The Timberwolves select Kevin Garnett from Farragut Academy. A high school kid? No chance. He saw the future of what basketball was about to become. He does whatever it takes to win a basketball game. All I know is all out. I want to be challenged to the end. Anything possible!